is your internal internal uh, control freak. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And I'm excited to be back in the studio with my buddy for a second <laughs> time in a row with no interruptions in between. Uh, feels good to be back. I am a walking interruption. <laughs> I like that. You know what? It's pretty accurate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You uh, you had uh, a lot of things going on this week. Uh, and you, you're, none, you're, none good either. <laughs> yeah, you're a little bit of an angle there. Uh, your yeah. back's still hurting you. Yeah, my back's toast. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm like doing a podcast right now with a weight belt on because that, <laughs> because that's normal. So, hey, anything to keep you supported. Yeah, you need it. yeah. I like what you've done with the studio, though. We've got the uh, we've got the lens and uh, variable <laughs> ND UV filter flex yeah. going on. I, I don't know if uh, Zach looks like ten times better than I do in YouTube right now, but uh, he's got himself a new toy. Yeah, we're uh, filming uh, on my new camera today, so yeah. uh, you can have all the 4K detail of my beard rendered down to 1080. <laughs> yeah, he, he was looking forward to doing the side by side comparison that everybody's been looking for, which is Canon versus Sony. <laughs> <laughs> Someone forgot their I, uh, toy. I forgot the R5. Yeah. It wasn't to be a, a A7S III versus R5 battle today, but yeah. so far it's uh, A7S III I'm not crushing gonna lie. the ADD. I'm a little, uh, I'm a little concerned, so... <laughs> Hopefully it lives up, but it, oh, it they're takes, both great cameras. Oh, no, so. it'll we'll get some usage out of it. And you got great glass, so yeah. But uh, you you would enjoy those filter cases. Those are pretty legit. Um, magnetic, mag- magnesium, whatever's. Um, These little, yeah. Oh, nice. Those come with them, and then they nice. also come with a soft case for magnesium, them so you can start it on fire when you're uh, in survival mode out in the. Well, mo- when you run out of uh, flint, so you all can I gotta just do throw is those just in shave, the water, shave yeah. some off yeah, of this, exactly. and uh, nice. Um, and then you can just pull the circular polarizer off and then start a fire with the sun, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyways, back in the studio, uh, have a couple things that happened in the news uh, this week. Um, you know, the biggest thing that come out was we posted some information. Oh, thank God. Um, I thought you were going to go politics. (laughs) No, we steer clear of that stuff around here. Um, but ATV.com beat us to the punch on getting patents of the new, uh, YXZ, suspension uh, patents out on on the webs is that do we know this definitively is this what is that what we're looking at here or are we looking at like uh cj greaves yamaha <laughs> i would say that uh, somebody's that, been working with cj because this is very um, familiar it's what very he close had, to what he's at, been at hammers yeah so uh uh earlier last week or this week sorry the uh atv.com posted the patents uh that yamaha has been pushing through the patent office um and they include a number of unique and interesting details for anyone that's a yamaha fan right um and the first thing that popped up was uh new shock setups and locations um, and the inclusion of trailing arms. Yeah. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on a YXZ with trailing arms? Uh, what I'm looking at looks vaguely reminiscent of a pre-runner, and I like it. Um, my initial reaction was as if they build this with a clutch, uh, not a sport shift, which they'll build both probably, but it it may be mine. If I mean, obviously, if it has a turbo, but uh, I, I'm I'm excited. Hopefully they build it. You know, when do they typically come out with a new rig? Is July, August, or June, July, somewhere in there? Yamaha? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, about every hundred years. Yeah, yeah, it's been <laughs> about that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the interesting thing is that it doesn't look like the axles are getting pushed back further. Any, so I don't know if you've gained any wheel right. base with this setup, but um, the, no- the notable things uh, on this are that they went to a trailing arm setup with what would appear to be a three-link um, radius rod setup, so you would have your normal trailing with a front tow link. Uh, so essentially kind of like the Can-Am, uh, but with the tow link in the front versus the back. Um, I think the Honda is set up that way, and I it think is. the KRX might be set up that way as well. Um, and then they show, in the patents, they show two sets of shocks. They show a coil over and then also an external bypass shock, which is interesting to me. Um, which might also include, you know, some indicators that this might be just them protecting their race series, you know, patents, um, making sure that the, the teams are having their stuff covered by, by legal. So, um, you know, this all might not be consumer stuff. This might all just be Honda racing or uh, Yamaha racing, uh, protecting their assets. We all want it to be Ian stuff. Not, <laughs> well, yeah. Ian does. Yeah. <laughs> 
I want it to be my stuff. Yeah. Uh, anything else on on the back of that suspension that you noticed any different? I mean, the shock uh, with the going away from the A arm going to a trailing arm obviously changes locations on the bottom, but on the top, is that very far off what you know of uh, the shocks on the current Wagzies? Uh, that is majorly far off from what it is that we've been seeing. Uh, this total redesign. Right. The yeah. whole rear end of the car is different, For right? sure. For sure. And you can see that they have like this overarching frame body here that almost looks like a wheel well, but it's actually part of the frame and it boxes up at the top. And um, so I'd, normally you would have almost like a, a front A-arm set up in the rear of a YXZ, right? Where the shock would go down to the Wishbone. lower A-arm yeah. and, and mount right above the motor almost. Right. Um, and this setup is much more like you, what you would see in a Can-Am or a, a Razor or any of those, or even maybe like a trophy truck, right? And speaking of a trophy truck, some of the other patents that came out um, included a solid axle design. What do you think about that? I, I honestly don't know. I mean, it's very similar to what a trophy truck does, like you mentioned there. Um, you think there's a home for something like that on uh, on a side-by-side, -side? you know? You're gaining. Are, are you are you gaining probably a little bit more stability, like in the desert and stuff? It seems like it would be a very very purpose oriented car that might not be applicable just say in tight trails. But right, you know. it's more. I mean, every time you see a solid axle setup, you either are thinking about you know uh, beefy solid axle trucks that do off road like crawling and stuff like that. Or where you need the suspension to be separate from the cab, where they can both articulate at different angles. Or you see it out in the whoops in the desert. Yeah. And that's what intrigues me, because this, to me, seems more like uh, an entrance into taking desert racing seriously versus short track. Right. Because the YXZ obviously has been traditionally a it's short Turner. track monster, right? But if you're going to go solid axle, um, you're going to need a lot more travel for those wheels versus what you would normally have on the wishbone or A-arm or, or trailing arm even. Um, on a solid axle setup, you have to have um, the ability for it to float. And I don't think you can do that without extending the wheelbase. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, if you look at these two diagrams there, they're, they're much, much different from one another, both in the shape, the cage, the whole ball of wax. And, uh, just to get people talking and stuff like that, do you, do you, do you want me to share the rumor I heard? What's that? Electric. You think they would go with a solid axle electric? I, I heard that an electric side-by-side -side will be coming a lot sooner than we think, and it may be coming from across overseas. You think overseas was willing to play ball on that? I don't know if that's what we're looking at, but I did hear that from hmm. a pretty reputable well, source. You can see here on the solid axle diagram, they have a center muffler. Yeah, it's pointed upward, which yeah. naturally that's how you would want it, right? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that does kind of uh, come across awkward a bit. Yeah. Um, whereas the uh, non-solid axle definitely comes straight out the back like it normally does, right? Yeah, that's exactly that. That rendering on the left looks a lot like what. Uh, not not too many changes between a 2019. Uh, when did they move to that cage design there? That's 2018, 2019. I it's think it's 2019. Yeah, yeah. So the rendering on the left looks like 2019. The rendering on the right looks a little bit more like my cage. You know, with the way that it bowed out and stuff like that, it. Uh, oh, uh, I can see up at the top. It's even bowed at the top yeah. right there. It's got an arch on it. I mean, you still have the protrusion bars. You got the those the didn't C crossbars, yeah, and those didn't come stock. And you can so. see that these are. <clears throat> you can see that these are on a on a bracket versus uh, welded on. Yeah. So it's very interesting <laughs> what they're doing there. Um, and you can see that this whole rear support area is gone because if it, on a solid axle you wouldn't have it attached, right? None of that would be solidly attached to the the engine area right and uh somebody was commenting in the forums about um you know the dual shock setup and you know from the factory it doesn't mean they have to include a dual shock they can just have eyelets on the arms or on the mounting points to accommodate dual shocks uh and just be planning from it from the beginning yeah but uh, on this one with the solid axle uh somebody was pointing out you know the second arm out here and uh, if you look over here on the on the flex diagrams, you can see those are just the attachment points. Those are just the the arms that attach the the solid axle body to the frame. And there's usually two of them. If you look on a on a rock bouncer, right, that's what they have underneath them. They have two points of connection, usually at the center and then at the outside, to that the the axles you know rotate on one central point, but they also have the ability to go up and down freely. So it'll be interesting to see what they do if that ever comes to the light of day. If that ever becomes a consumer product, let alone a race team product, 
Um, and this, the solid axle uh, design concept is interesting because for one, it puts the diff on the arm, right? On the axles. Uh, and then this big boxed I-beam setup that they got going on, that's a lot of material. Like that's not just a little bit of, you know, factory radius rod metal. That's quite a bit of I-beam structure there. So if it's intentional, get a little bit more weight rear bias. Well, you know, that's the thing in racing with YXZs, right? If you're taking those out on the desert, they say put more weight on the back, put your spare tire on the back bumper so it keeps your tail end down. Yeah, that's why I'm wearing a back belt right now is for my years of going through whoops on a YXZ. <laughs> you're paying your penance? That's right. So, um, yeah, it's super interesting to see what they're going to do with this. Um, you know, I, as a guy that enjoys rock crawling and doing obstacle-based navigation, um, a YXZ with a short wheelbase would be amazing, let alone a long wheelbase where you can take it out wide open in the desert and just destroy the whoops and destroy, you know, some of that, the silty stuff out in the desert. So you get a, let's say they come to the table with an offering like this with a turbo and a manual and a legit clutch, not a sport shift. Are you interested? I'm interested in anything that's high performance as long as it doesn't kill my back. Yeah. And that was my biggest complaint with the YXZ was that I got in it and I felt like I was being beat up. Yeah, same same for me with the Honda as well. Like there were th- a lot of things that I loved about the Honda, but it was really hard to get over how rough it rode, rode stock. So, and uh, speaking of turbos, you know, you caught this before I did the the inclusion of a turbo in the actual patents, right? And uh, I was thinking, well, you know, maybe that's just part of the the whatever. But it's but you pointed it out, and we colored it with some green and red, and you can definitely tell that that was a turbo in the patent designs. Well, it's eerily. Uh, reminiscent of GYTR's turbo kit that you can get. Uh, you know, it seems like the placement on everything is real similar to what what their setups are like. Yeah, the um, it, it's kind of interesting that this is also very similar to what like Robbie Gordon's doing with his engine, where the turbo is basically right on the manifold outside the out on the header, right, and it goes straight to the turbo. There's no piping around the motor like the, like the Polaris does, where it goes quicker spool up. Right, and you, so you're going to get more pressure, you're going to get faster spool, more power to the wheels faster. Um, so it'd be interesting if they're if they're actually going to build one of those. I mean, you know, uh, it was interesting. I was listening to Robbie talk about, you know, their setup and, and the reason they went to build their own motor was, you know, because they quote unquote shopped around for a motor. And one of the things that he did say was he asked Yamaha if they would supply him with their turbo motor. Do you know of a turbo Yamaha side by side motor? I know of a snowmobile motor. Yeah, but um, but anyway, so that was interesting. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if um, is a nitro even turbo or is that thing supercharged? I think it's supercharged. I'm not as familiar with their sleds, but I know that they have all the variants. Yeah. So, um, so anyways, yeah, this would be interesting. You can see the the sway bar connection here. It's pretty beefy. Um, I would suspect that uh, they are not going to be kidding around with that design if it ever comes out. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, we've heard rumors in the past of Yamaha coming out with a new monster. Do you think that what you've seen in these applications has anything that resonates with what you've heard of in the past? Nothing. Th- this is nothing even close to what. Now, mind you, I've heard rumors about something that Yamaha has had coming since 2018. Like, Maybe even yeah no 2018. I, I the the last one I heard was from an employee of uh, a major audio manufacturer that supports the side by side industry that it came from. It wasn't like a procurement meeting or anything like that, but it, it he had uh, had some visibility. I don't know if he'd done like an NDA or something, but all he would say was that Yamaha had something big coming. Fast forward three years, we saw the R Max, but. Do you, you know, feel that was big enough to justify that no, comment? No. Th- this particular person, that if they said that something big was com- coming, it was dune and desert-oriented. Right. That it wanted to have been a recreational. Yeah, it would, it would have been a sport machine. But, gotcha. Yeah. I, I mean, whether there was validity to it, I don't know. Or if, it, you know, obviously COVID's delayed some stuff. So maybe they had something in the works and it's just got put on the back burner. Do you think Yamaha is in a flexible enough position to, say, start development on a, a whole new platform and then pivot because of what maybe other people have been doing like the turbo s or the rrs or the um speed utv or do you think speed utv would even be someone that would be on their radar uh pr- 
Probably not. I mean, obviously, the YXC really marched to the beat of its own drum. It was unlike any other machine out there. Uh, to to answer your question, though, are they a versatile enough or a, a you know a company that could theoretically do something like that for sure? But will they? I mean, and they have a history of being very conservative. I don't know. I don't know that 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 we're going to see some sort of major shot across the bow in the industry from them. So if they were to come out with this new YXZ platform or a replacement, um, out of what you've seen in the patents and what you know of, if your experience in the past with the YXZs, what would you be, what would be the, like the top three things that you would want to see that would make you jump ship back from Can-Am to Yamaha? Uh, it's got to, it's got to treat me a little bit better in the whoops. I mean, obviously a suspension redesign has the potential to do that, but adding wheelbase would really do that. Um, the sport shift needs a little bit more room on its ceiling for power. Like if you went up over like 15 PSI on a sport shift, you were really exposing some weak points in that transmission, that clutch system. Um, I would like to, if they're going to stick with that, well, they are going to stick with that. I mean, there's just no gray area there. Do you think um, they would come out with the both options or do you think they would just stick with one? Although I, I'd be shocked if they didn't bring out a manual. That's their biggest selling feature is guys that want to that want to rip and shift, you know, drive it like a rally car. So your your top three would be suspension, yeah, wheelbase. Let's just put it this way: I loved my Yamaha, but it has a long ways to go before I would jump, jump back in. Yeah, it. that I would jump into. Uh, you know, the Yamaha YXZ that I want right now, uh, Weller Racing makes. You know, you've seen their KOH right. uh, YXZ, and that KOH YXZ is just strength on strength and just beefy and bad news and awesome and i could just keep talking about it for 15 minutes it's 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 rad what about like, performance wise because i know that like oh yeah it's, it's turboed i can't remember how many psi you told me i want to say it was uh for the for the hammer setup if i remember right they were at the time they were running because they're with can am now but back then they i think they were running about eight to ten psi somewhere in there but what about the uh the transmission and all that because i know one of the common complaints why yxz owners is that you kind of have to plan your attacks and plan how you're going to transition the power band right so it, as far as that goes how would you like to see that change would you just sum it up with just more power or would you summarize it with maybe some different gearing or uh so what is that now i know i we're, we're talking about hammers cars so when we're talking about ha like if i if i basically what i'm promoting is if they did a um a little bit more utility type based application or transmission you know the uh, if, I, if i remember correctly the uh, yxc guys on, at king of hammers were doing was like uh 30 percent 15 percent something like that gear reduction on the yxc um they need to yamaha definitely needs to do something like that because the car doesn't crawl particularly well it will you just have to tackle it with a ton of momentum that's something that would have to get addressed what do you think about four low i think they're i think that's you got to have that these days, you know, yeah. and they've never had four low. Well, it's interesting. You might see a, an approach where I can't remember if Gordon's doing it this way. I think he is. But basically, you know, having, you know, like three gears, right, where you have you, you instead of a low and a high, right, you have first, second and third and yeah. first and you can start in any three of them if you want to. But basically it just says you know the ratio of gear one is a lot different than gear two and gear two is a lot different than gear three and gear three is meant to be high speed cruising gear one is for rock crawling and gear two being you know general purpose where you can start from a standstill in any three of them but uh the gearing ratio is going to be quite different right right so what's it going to take to get you to jump into one like what would you want to see besides beating you up too bad because um, like the ergos in the cab are pretty good for a taller guy. Like sitting in it isn't terrible. It's definitely once you're the, in it, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. My biggest problem was always getting in and out of it. Um, and it seemed like you were really close to the dash, even though you were comfortable once you were in it. Um, I feel like there there needs to be more flexibility in um, the in and out experience of the car and that you just have a little bit more room between you and the steering wheel. Um, you know, but as a race inspired vehicle, you want to be close to the steering wheel. That's kind of the point so that your arms are relaxed while you're steering. Yeah. Um, so I get that. Um, but, uh, but more room, uh, longer wheelbase would be a minimum for me. Like if it's not longer, if it's not competitive with the wheelbase of all the, the Polaris and Can-Am models, 
I wouldn't even consider it unless there was yeah. a track of me getting to that point with a with suspension upgrade to replace OEM parts or something that, that made sense. But um, and then just power, it would just have to be able to compete, uh, you know, uh, putting power to the ground. Well, Yamaha's was pretty, you know, I don't know where their mentality is now, but they were pretty gun shy because they overbuilt. What I mean by overbuilt is actual physical units, not strength of the car. They overbuilt YXZs. I mean, you can, you can literally go to a dealer in some parts of the country and find a 2017 YXZ brand new. Right. It's still, it just hasn't sold. Um, Yamaha got gun shy about that, that they overproduced it. And I think the reason they didn't sell through them, obviously, it's what year did the car come out? It was 16. So in 16, you had the X3. The X3 came out. You already had a turbo RZR. And then a year and a half, two years later, Can-Am bumped it up to 172 horse. Uh, Polaris followed suit and went up to 168. Polaris brought out Dynamics. So here's this this YXZ that right at right when it came out in 2016 everybody's losing their minds i i did it looked awesome it looked rad but then the other two big oes came right back across the bow and like no you need this right and they were right um so here's here's yamaha stuck with all these models and it makes them reluctant to make major changes to the platform or come out with something new then they bring out the r max and they can't keep them in stock every one they've built they've sold so and that speaks it's, to the the tooling, right? Like the R Max is just new molds and a few upper upper chassis parts. The rest of it underneath is fairly similar to what they had before. Yeah. So that yeah. speaks to their mentality on on change. The YXZ was probably three to four tweaks away from being very competitive sales wise with the other sport machines. Uh, suspension being one, turbo being another, and uh, that may be it. You know, me personally, I'd l- I would have loved to see it a little bit wider. I think mine was 60, 65, somewhere in there. But, uh, yeah, I think it was pretty close. It just wasn't long enough, wasn't wide enough. If you've ever gone through the whoops, you probably feel like I feel right now. Uh, big chiropractor, <laughs> Bill. <laughs> yeah. Jar of kidney loose, but great yeah. car. Yeah, so hopefully they come out with at least a variation of what we've seen in these patents because I think any of the changes we've seen are just going to greatly improve the consumer experience and the options for them to have an awesome car. Right, right. And so the uh, second big news, I guess it's not really big news, but you know, this time of year is when the spring dealer shows are happening. And uh, next week, and this week actually, uh, Can-Am's having their de- uh, dealer show down in, I think, Arizona. Um, and, uh, there's been a few different, um, dealers that have like YouTube presences and things like that, that have been out riding around in the new fully enclosed HVAC defenders. You know, that's pretty cool. Um, wouldn't mind trying one of those out. Those, those seem like a legit, uh, setup competitive with, uh, a Ranger, uh, North Star edition that has those same features where it's fully enclosed carpeted and has the heater and AC and all that stuff. Um, but, uh, Can-Am. They're teasing. They, they, te- they threw out a video teaser of, you know, the typical, um, vehicle lists, trail ride and, you know, dirt flying and all that stuff saying, um, uh, the, qu- I think the quote was, uh, some, a, a vehicle to do it all. And, uh, to me, that doesn't sound like a sport machine. Sounds like a general. Sounds like a Polaris general, right? Yep. Now, looking at the current lineup of, of models, you know, you have the Defender, the X3, the Maverick Sports, the Maverick Trail, which essentially are the same thing. And then you have the Commander, which has always been what I consider the, the Can-Am putt The general, yeah. Um, so do you think we would see a refreshed Commander? Do you think we would see maybe a new model altogether? Or do you think um, they're going to stick to what they have and uh, maybe just provide some more utilitarian Mavericks? Uh, a rig to do it all, to me, means narrow with some ground. Cl- it, it Basically, to me, it, it feels like a little bit more utility-based Maverick sport. That's kind of how that that sales pitch you think was maybe absorbed a, by me. The Maverick Sport, but with a bed? Something. Yeah, that that's kind of what, you know, the little teaser trailer, that's kind of what it felt like because it looked like it was filmed in like Hatfield McCoy or something super yeah, green, almost like Quantico or something. But it, uh, yeah, it definitely looked like whatever's coming is trail oriented. Because, I mean, if you look at their lineup, you know, they all have a very aggressive modern look to them, except for the Commander. 
the commander looks like 19 or uh, 2015, 2016. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if they come out with a new commander and maybe do what they did with the X3 and all of a sudden you have, you know, seven trims right from the get go. Uh, the X3 came out with the turbo and everything and there. I think there was like two trims, two or three trims. And then uh, the next year following that, there was like 11 trims. Yeah, there's a DS, RS, and then all of a sudden uh, RRs, XMRs, or not RRs, RCs, uh, the MUD one. XMRS. XMRS. All that stuff. Yeah. So, totally confusing. If I were to put my money on something, I would put my money on the Commander being the upra- updated and refreshed vehicle just because it's so old. Yeah, I could see that for sure. Now, that being said, what do you wish they were re- releasing next week? Uh, an Overland-centric dual-purpose type thing like maybe a, a defender um def- maybe kind of like a hybrid between because the commander doesn't have it's not a big machine by any stretch so if you kind of get a little bit of a happy medium between the commander and the defender i i think that that would probably be pretty hot for something like that i think that the defender probably just doesn't have a lot of the ergo creature comforts while you're sitting in the cab enough to want to jump into it for a thousand miles right you know the x3 is like sitting in a couch right you know so i think that uh both the x3 and the maverick sport i could see sitting in for a long amount of time for sure i've never sat in a maverick sport i it just consider it like an x3 except more upright and a little bit narrower between you and the door so just like an x3 only crappy got it (laughs) (laughs) um you know i got a chance to sit in a in a maverick sport rc and um, our buddy Corbin over in Idaho has one of those and it's all decked out and everything, but it's surprisingly comfy. It's kind of like my Subaru. Like when I went and bought my Subaru Outback, I'm a big guy. Like I'm tall, I'm wide, I'm, I'm big boned as they say. And I got in it and it was odd to me being snug in something where I'm used to like a truck or a, you know, a big cab vehicle. Um, but once I sat in it and I felt the ergonomics of it, it all made sense, right? And that's how I felt going into the Maverick Sport. Was like It was like, oh, it's smaller, but at the same time, it feels good. It feels right. Um, and it kind of feels it's reminiscent of the uh, R-Max. The R-Max, you get in it. It's not like a huge cab or anything, but you feel in it. You feel, you feel correct in it. Like, it yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I haven't met anybody that owns one that doesn't love it, though. You know, I, I sure. think I know about five people, and... Um, Three of the five told me that where they're going to go get a new machine tomorrow, it would be another sport. Right. No, they make a ton of sense. And yeah. they have the the RC, and uh, which is wider, and then they have the regular sports, which are narrower. So right. uh, great all-around car. And I don't <clears throat> think they would want to mess with it. I think they would want to bring more value to the commander and bring maybe that um, trim uh, value, that MSRP spread up higher than it has been with options from base to, you know, more extreme. That's why you can still see an X3 with less horsepower, right? Like they don't all have 195 horsepower. So I think they're going to do the same thing with the commander and just bring it up to modern standards of uh, abilities and travel and wheelbase and all that stuff. So I mentioned a uh, kind of a hybrid between those two. What would you like to see? If it were me, I would like to see them compete directly with the general you know, just like, because you look at their model, like nothing looks like a general outside of the Defender, right? And that's just because it's boxy. So I think a direct general competitor, and if they can make the commander that, that'd be awesome. But the general is is interesting because it's basically just a more upright, bigger, boxier Razor, which is a sport machine with, you know, A-arms in the back instead of trailing arms. So I th- I would like to see a more direct competitor that way where you can have four seats and a bed, and plenty of headroom and plenty of cabin comforts where you have, you know, silly things like cup holders and storage space and, you know, audio systems and, and accessories like that. But uh, I think something more boxy, more trucky, I think would be awesome. What are the odds that they come out with another sport machine? Polaris did. Well, think about what Polaris did, though. They brought out a new generation to replace what they already had. Like, that's just going to end up being what happens. Like, you're not going to see XPs um, stick around. You're going to see pro XPs and then pro <coughs> Rs come out. So um, <laughs> the uh, the fact that they would come out with a new machine. I mean, the X3 is long in the tooth, right? It's it's due for it's due for a refresh. 
but um, it's still bitching. Though. But it's still it's still dominating. Yeah. So I don't. And when I say dominating, I'm not saying the market like as in general, but for what they're built for, the way people use them in the desert and all that stuff, the dunes, they're dominating, right? So it's ahead of anything Yamaha, uh, Cali, and uh, Honda's doing, right? So I think they have a. You know, they're obviously a big company. They obviously have, have worked all this out and they're in a good spot. I don't think they need another sport side by side. Um, we do. But the consumer might be demanding it. The general consumer market might be demanding it. Um, but I think having something that directly competes with a general, but with more horsepower and more wheel travel would be sporty enough that it would probably take a lot of that consumer market away from Polaris. Now, when I say a lot, I'm not saying like Polaris would be hurting at all, but I think that it would definitely be an attention getter and, and a lot of people would be paying, um, you know, a lot more focus to what can ams doing. And I personally would love to see something more competitive on that line because I've told you before, if I were to go buy a, a vehicle today, it may very well have been a general because I want that storage option. I want that upright trucky feel. I want the overlanding capabilities of that vehicle versus something that is kind of pigeonholed to kind of a layout, you know, scenario that, that doesn't work for what I want to do. So if you had something that was bigger, uh, longer, boxier, lots of storage, you know, that would be killer. And it would take a lot of, honestly, a lot of market share and not by, it would take away some market share from the Polaris Rangers. A lot of guys use Rangers for hunting, for expeditions, for, you know, backwoods stuff because they're not looking to go fast. They're just looking to like haul a bunch of stuff, a bunch of wood or, or an animal or, you know, whatever the cases may be, supplies. And so they use rangers because of the, the the load capacities and things like that. So maybe maybe compete on that level and, and kill two birds with one stone. So if you were to start a build tomorrow, what would it be? Four-seater general? Four-seater, and it would most likely be a general. And it would probably, it would probably, you know, if I were to be doing all bolt-ons, you know, it would be an instant instant decision to upgrade to like an HCR long travel kit or something like that. Um, if it was money, no option, I'd probably throw a trailing arm setup on it, um, and go longer, longer wheelbase than it is. What if you just started with a turbo S and did something like what Savage did? The, the turbo S is still an amazing platform. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. If I, if I was going to start, uh, I know, uh, a new build and retire my two seater to a sand car, I think I would start with, well, it would be a, it'd be a coin flip right now between a max and a turbo S for both four seaters. It, but the other part of it, though, in the back of my head would be to maybe start on a Pro XP4, just knowing that there's a new setup coming down the road that may be able to be swapped out. So I, I like that idea. I just don't like the idea of dumping 10 grand on a long travel. And believe me, I've done it. It, it is. It's 10. Like by the time you do all the axles and... and uh, by upgrade the, time, the ball joints, upgrade the hubs, yeah. upgrade the bearings, upgrade everything. Yeah, it's yeah. 10. And, upgrade uh, the shocks. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> no comment. <laughs> but uh, that's why I would start with a Dynamics uh, Turbo S. I think that if you're putting money into a car today, that if you're debating on the, on the whole, like, do I stick with Walker Evans or go Dynamics on a Polaris buy, um, you're shooting yourself in the foot. I don't think there's any reason to not jump up if you can afford it. Yeah, unless you're prepared to dump like 3,500 to five into it right off the bat by getting rid of that combination and going to something better. You know, the dynamics isn't the end all be all by any account, no. but it's light years ahead of that. You'll still need to do spring kits and all that stuff, but yeah. uh, the 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 difference is in the shock itself. The shock having you know a bump stop inside instead of none. Um, you know, the valving and all that stuff. The the adjustability of the Foxes versus the Walker Evans. Yeah. And uh, just the size, these cars are coming out with two inch shocks that just they get super hot, super fast. Yeah, and they fade, especially if more more than a couple of people are in the car with you. Yeah, yeah. So especially if you're you're planning on being out all day or all week, like you know we've been doing, and um, you know you gotta you gotta have a car that's going to last more than a couple hours of riding. Yeah. How's the Turbo S in the back seat? Because I've I've actually sat in the back seat of the Pro, mm -hmm. and it, I've got room when I'm six four. The ergonomics between the Pro and the regular XP uh, aren't that much different in the back seat. Because the Max is not fantastic for taller taller <laughs> people. I, I actually think the Max is probably better for gear in the back. The Max has a little bit of a sloped uh, cage 
from the factory. Yeah. Um, and then if you go, you know, obviously with a like a cage like you did with yours, um, you know, it's a lot shorter in the back. So that makes a huge difference. And the Polaris is very, very much like six inches of headroom all the way around. So um, the difference there is noticeable. Um, but the thing about the Can-Am Max is that you're at a much more tilted back angle. So getting in and out's more awkward, squeezing your legs and feet through the openings more awkward. Um, and so vehicles like the Polaris are a little bit more open, a little bit more upright. And so you, it, the experience is more roomier. Yeah. Even though technically speaking between seat to seat, you may be pretty close. Uh, the experience is a lot different because of the angles. Yeah. And the main reason that I would start on an adventure bike, uh, bike, uh, an adventure type build. Did you just move to the South real know, quick right? and start calling cars bikes? Well, yeah, no, I have bike on the brain, but like, uh, if I, the reason I would start with that four seater is, uh, I just think, you know, there's still an incredible fun factor there and you can get that thing, do everything that you wanted to do to set it up as a dual sport type machine and still go take it out to the sand dunes and have a blast. You know, I, we, that's, that's why I'm, I'm not surprised that you're choosing the general, but you, you and I kind of need a side by side to do more than just dune. Mm -hmm. do more than just adventure rides. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I could see you doing a general, but I wouldn't be surprised if we wound up with a turbo on it. Oh, for sure. I would, I would definitely be looking at my options and I have seen, um, a few people do razor engine and transmission swaps. Um, and recently and more recently, you're starting to see people do, you know, pro XP engine swaps, um, on the normal XPs, um, because they're so similar. But, uh, but yeah, I would definitely be wanting more power. But like I've told you before, the experience on these long trips, right? Like you just, you tend, you start to realize how little you're using that power when you're just doing switchbacks all day. You'd be surprised how much I'm on that turbo out front. <laughs> <laughs> you would be shocked. Uh, the, the only time I'm not on that gas is on blind corners and that's about it. You well, know, but I mean, think about your average mile per hour across the day is worth a trip, right? Right. Well, the reason I bring it up and the reason I'm on the gas is I'm not some wild man out there driving way over their head. It's to keep dust down. And the further out I can get, the more I can relay back, the more comfortable everybody else is, less dust in the air. Bob's your uncle. <laughs> that, <that's laughs> those, are, those are some really good excuses. Ian. <laughs> well, I, 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 the main reason that I like the idea of starting with the Max and starting with the Turbo S is based on the fact that you're, you're basically getting the most off-road capable side-by-side -side in production today, and that's your starting point. Right. I like that. I think that if I were to be approaching it from a, like, I'm not concerned with keeping the original this or that, like I plan on replacing everything type scenario... Um, I would probably go with an X3 Max for the simple reason that, and, and probably like the RR with the smart shocks and all that, because those are three inch shocks. Those are three inch Fox shocks. Yep. And they have all the sensors and everything. And there's going to be a number of OEMs coming out or uh, uh, aftermarket manufacturers coming out with a lot of upgrades for those here soon, including shock therapy uh, that are going to make those level, those shocks next level. So, um, the ability, the, the interesting thing about those is that they're still, um, capable of receiving the IQS upgrade. So if you have the Fox shocks, the smart shocks, Fox shocks from get it out, can am X three, uh, the, Hey, can you, can you start that over? <laughs> the smart shocks, Fox shocks, X three shocks, um, if you, if you get those shocks, you can put the, the IQS on it. And so what that does is it gives you everything the shock has in adjustability times three. So it's kind of like gears on a, on a mountain bike, right? Where you have some gears that cross over a little bit, but your range is affected differently, right? So the same thing applies to the shocks when you take the valving, the, the needle, and you put it at three different positions along with all the rest of the adjustability and the, and the, the rebound adjustability and all that stuff. And then your shock just becomes three times more versatile. And so that's probably where I would start, start just knowing that I would be replacing a lot of the other things, including the cage and probably the subframe. Yeah. Because, yeah, I don't know if you've seen the geyser uh, replacement frames that they came out with. See, now you're just talking winning the lotto. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were like eight grand, something like that. Yeah, that's eight grand that's not going into the motor. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're already starting with 195 horse, I mean, you can live with that for a while. The other thing eight grand does is it funds a lot of trips. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. It yeah. plays for a lot of gas, right? It does. So anyways, I think that, uh, 
you know, just ergonomics, if I was keeping a, a, a vehicle pretty stock as far as that goes and just upgrading some things like wheels, suspension, uh, springs, valving, whatever, I'd probably go, I'd probably go Polaris, maybe Turbo S just because of the, it's already set up most of the way I want it anyways. And then if I was going to go full, full build, custom, everything, I would probably go with an, uh, an X3 Max. Yeah. I, I, I could see both, but you know, hopefully, hopefully Robbie's car can enter the equation and change some minds as well. Because it's, I mean, well, if we want to set up a lot like if a we want to go back three months when the the Speed UTV was released, yeah, you know, right. we can we can do that game and say <laughs> that you know I want one of the, a UTT and then a full Safari cage on it, and I can just <laughs> I can just see all the people at home right now ticked off about the fact that it's hey you think that's funny, bro? <laughs> I've been reserved for like two years, bro. <laughs> 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 oh man, those those the comment threads are just awesome. Anyways, so uh, Can Am coming out with their new model release, their what I call their late twenty one model releases because they already announced their early twenty one releases at last fall. So uh, these would be your mid year twenty one releases, um, and perfect time for a refreshed model to come out. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, twenty twenty one's upon us, man. We're uh. What do we have? We're halfway through February right now. We're going to be in a week and a half to two weeks. Two weeks? Week and a half. Week and a half. We're going to Oregon. Going to ride in sand. In two weeks, we'll be in Oregon. From? We'll be ending our Oregon trip. Ending so a week our, and a half. Yeah, yeah. So a <laughs> week and a half, we're yeah. out of here. Um, and then the year starts for us. <laughs> we can finally call 2020 to yeah. the end. <laughs> so uh, uh, do you have anything on the plate? As far as what you want to get done on the car before we get crazy this year, big expedition mm. stuff. Uh, last time we were in the garage, you mentioned some stuff that you wanted to do with the the cage and the and the luggage rack and all that stuff. Yeah, um, I want to. Uh, the big discussion right now on the turbo uh, is getting the shocks done. We're still running the Walker Evans shocks that were generously donated to us by Rich Maxey. Um, so, Rich. <laughs> Thank you very much. We love you. Um, the The Fox shocks have been sitting there collecting dust. They need to get re- rebuilt completely. And so, um, working, trying to w- work with some partner, try to find some partners that will work with us on documenting that. I want to. I want to go through that from beginning to end and and document it so that everyone can. Um, see what's all involved. See what's happening. See what you're paying for, and seeing what the the chain, what the the effect of that investment is. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, we want to go to a mid long travel kit. So we don't want to go full wide. We just want to go a little bit wider than we are. So maybe up to like 68 and then, um, do, um, some six plus one offset wheels, uh, versus the four plus three that we're doing now. So the, the steering, the oversteering and all that stuff that comes with, um, four plus three, uh, has been a little bit not to our taste. So, uh, we're talking about that then includes, replacing the A-arms, replacing the trailing arms, replacing um, the axles, that all comes into play. Um, and so we're really interested into uh, maybe the HCR kit. Uh, they have a mid-travel kit that looks really nice. Um, and then going up to some upgraded ball joints um, and getting away from these uh, mass-produced um, small ones. Yeah. What kind of ball joints are you looking at? Like a, turn, um, like a turner or a... Yeah, uh, so there's... Um, obviously, everyone's going to say Keller, right? Yeah. Um, but there's also a few other uh, smaller manufacturers that make some amazing, amazing greasable uh, ball joints that really just blow the socks off any other options. Yeah. So those Kellers are huge. Um, if you go to an HCR long travel RCV axles and Keller ball joints, it's probably half the cost of my car. <laughs> <laughs> and now on your pro, you have RCV ball joints, yeah. right? Uh, I have RCV, uh, yeah, RCV axles, RCV ball joints. I'm trying to think of what else. And so yeah. those are other, you know, those are all great options. Yeah, I still and don't have the uh, fronts put on yet, though. The front what? Yeah. Front uh, axles. It's running Turbo S up front. You're still Turbo S up yeah. front? Yeah. Huh. Time. Do you still, don't have do you it. have them? No, they're over in uh, Seattle. Oh, yeah. Okay. Along with my doors and my exhaust <laughs> and my tune <laughs> and my clutch. Oh boy. Yeah. Guess where All the car for the is? Pro? Guess where the car is? Is it not here? Four miles to the southwest and not in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, there there's just there's a lot of things, and then you know the last time it was ridden was there was some some noise that came from the front diff. 
So I would imagine now that we're at, you know, close to 5,000 miles on that machine that it's probably pushing the, the limits of what the Polaris 16 front diff is probably rated for. Um, and that probably needs to get rebuilt. So if anyone's listening and you're a manufacturer of front differential rebuild kits, let us know. <laughs> we, uh, we have a project. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, uh, assuming that my steering box is okay on the X3 and I think it is. You so know, you I, mentioned last time that your steering was screwed up. Yeah. I just think it was low voltage, man. My car had been sitting for about four you months. You think the battery was just... Well, it's got a parasitic draw, and mm-hmm. and I don't know that it had seen it had been on charge, so I fired it up, let it run run for a while, and then noticed that the steering seemed relatively normal. Um, Did you put the dirt tires back on? Uh, the dirt tires are in my storage unit. It's on its it's on its sand tires right now. Uh, ITP graciously donated a set of the tenacities, so we will beat on those and uh, talk about. It. And the interesting thing about the tenacities is I'm moving from a Maxxis Liberty 32 to a Tenacity ITP 32. And these things are taller Mm -hmm. than the Chicane 33s on the Pro. Um, They feel feel kind of about maybe within a pound or two, maybe just a smidge uh, lighter than the Liberties. And they're a Teflon, they're not a steel belt. Um, But yeah, we're gonna wail on them. We're gonna beat the heck out of them. Do you have five Liberties? Yes. Maybe one, we should, one one brand new. Maybe we should do a uh, long term review on. Yeah, those. we could for sure. Yeah, let's do yeah. that. And yeah. then uh, let's measure up those other wheels and see what they actually measure out at. Yeah, they're not installed, and uh, um, I want to do a little service before we go to uh, just kind of a walk around and stuff like that before we go to Winchester. So maybe we just wheel into the garage. Maybe. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. All right, guys. So. <laughs> All right. So to wrap up the episode. We're going to go uh, get my car. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get busy. Yeah. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts, Are Spotify. We, I, th- I asked you this last week. We're on TikTok. Oh, boy. Someone get this old guy a phone that he can um, do TikTok on. I'm not doing TikTok. <laughs> this is a bunch, it's just a bunch of basic how, uh, basic. Uh, Karen's dance. I, I, my <laughs> wife shows it to me all the time. It's it, it's it's housewives dancing hey, or exercising. I I I was there with you, but then I found a really a bunch of really awesome ones. So <laughs> on TikTok, <laughs> on TikTok. So t- I'll I'll just say it right now. Tick. My wife went into the hospital for a surgery, mm-hmm. emergency surgery, and t- to get to that emergency surgery, we were in the hospital ER twice all day long, just waiting. Yeah. So those two days of of over ten hours of waiting. Um, we're consumed with TikTok because we we got on these bunny trails of just hilarity, and I, I think that's why they're succeeding. I think that's why they're growing is because you can get on these trails where it, the algorithm locks on just dead on to what you into entertains you, and just sucks you right in. Do you know who owns TikTok? Um, China, China, <laughs> China. <laughs> I can't I can't do a Trump invitation. It's huge. China. So anyways, back to what we were doing. We're leaving. (laughs) Hope you enjoyed the episode. Peace. (laughs) 